Well, good morning and welcome to worship, everyone. We're excited to be worshiping God with you on this Labor Day weekend. Uh, As you rest from your labors, receive the grace and encouragement and inspiration of God to, uh, to serve in this world. We're finishing up our summer reading series today. Next week, we're excited to bring a, a new worship series as we enter the tumultuous, uh, or I should say the fourth quarter of a tumultuous year, uh, 2020. We're going to be teaching Bible stories that uh, remind us that God always creates out of chaos, out of chaos. God always creates. Uh, We're excited to worship God with you through that theme uh, all the way into November. Today we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion. We invite you to notice at the worship page that you clicked on that there is a link there to show you how to uh, prepare to receive Holy Communion at home. I want to give you a brief update about our uh, plans as we enter into the fall next week. It's a rally day unlike any other in the 58 years of atonement. We are going to be worshiping outdoors, weather permitting, at 9.15 and 10.45, and that'll continue through the month of September. We're going to meet again as a church leadership team, the church council and executives, on um, September 15th to uh, think about October and the plans uh, going further into the fall. But worship outdoors for now, small groups gathering outdoors here at our campus as, as you're able. Excited by the uh, 10 or 12 small group leaders that I met with this week who are launching their ministry, so watch for the sm- sign up for small groups that will be coming up soon. And, uh, and I also want to just lift up the great work that Ann and Kara and Troy and Kevin are doing as they roll out on September 3rd the uh, resources and opportunities for families in children ministry, in youth ministry, in confirmation. God bless them. There's some really good stuff happening, so uh, reach out. Let us know if we can help you find connections to what we're doing with children, youth, and families starting next Sunday. Well, we're ready to worship God.
place in our homes for friends and family. look through a pair of binoculars? They make things that seem far away and fuzzy look close up and focused. You seem far away to me because I haven't seen you in a while, but I have been thinking of you and I have been praying for a good start to your school year. It's exciting to get back to school and things that are a little bit more normal, but they're not completely normal, are they? Everything keeps changing. And we don't know what to expect next. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel kind of fluttery inside and not in a good way. I need to keep my focus on Jesus. Jesus never changes. He is the same today as he was yesterday and will be tomorrow and every day after. He is thinking of us when we aren't thinking of him. He brings us joy when we feel sad. He gives us hope when we feel hopeless. He is steady when we feel shaky. In Matthew 28 20, Jesus promises to be with us always, even to the end of the age. All we have to say, do is say his name. Jesus, he's got this. Now, how can we keep our focus on Jesus? Mark your calendar for September 13th and drive up to the Kids Blast side of church. We will bring to your car a Kids Blast Home Edition kit. We are also going to be handing out frozen treats and you can receive your backpack blessing from the safety of your vehicle. I don't want you to think of these Kids Blast kits as more boring homework. Think of them as a fun way to keep our focus on Jesus. They're going to be filled with activity and coloring pages, video links for fun videos, even some toys, all to help us keep our focus on Jesus. I can't wait to see you. Remember, boys and girls, God loves you, and so do I. Welcome back, everyone, to our summer reading worship series, our last sermon in the series today. It's been fun to intersect the Bible with books and articles that uh, we've been reading. We hope that God has encouraged and 
inspired you in the living of our faith through this series. Next week, Kevin and I are excited to start a new worship series as we turn to the final quarter of a tumultuous 2020. We're going to be uh, preaching and teaching out of a series called Out of Chaos, God Creates. It's been our pattern to preach Uh, Old Testament or Hebrew Scriptures stories during the fall, the Bible that Jesus would have had access to, and that's what we'll mostly be doing all the way into November as we look into the Word of God for guidance in our lives now out of the chaos that uh, surrounds us in this fourth quarter of of 2020. God creates, God creates opportunity. Uh, Let's follow Jesus together. Well, today, Varsity Blues, an article that um, I read, I'll tell you more about, but to set the stage for that, let's open up the Bible to the uh, 20th chapter of Matthew, and I want to encourage you to open your phones or your Bibles, and you can read along with me in whatever translation you have. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and her sons, and Kneeling before him, he asked a favor of him, or she asked a favor of him. He said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able He said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, that is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been been prepared by my Father. Now when the ten heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called to them and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks. Be to God. Well, many months ago, Pastor Kevin sent an article to me that he had pulled from uh, a theological der- journal, Duke Divinity or Yale Divinity School uh, journal, uh, called Varsity Blues, or at least the title of indicating the article was Varsity Blues. The actual article was called uh, What Today's College Students can learn from St. Augustine. You can go to the next slide for us, Pastor Kevin. And uh, you can see it was published in the Jesuit Review called America, the Jesuit Review that refers to the tradition within our church Catholic of those who have followed Jesus out of the disciplines of uh, the the Jesuit group. Uh, That is, of course, the same crew that inspired the founding of Marquette University here in Milwaukee, And, uh, of course, uh, Pope Francis is the first Jesuit pope in the history of of the church Catholic. And so this uh, group of Christians has a journal that they published this article, What Today's College Students Can Learn from St. Augustine. Now, this article, as I read it, seemed particularly poignant even now, some many months later, as college students are already back on campus, and those that aren't are shortly headed there in this, again, uh, tumultuous season. Also timely in light of Aunt Becky. Becky, You remember Aunt Becky? We can see her on the screen now as well. Um, I think the program was full house. If we don't remember Aunt Aunt Becky, we might remember John Stamos. And uh, the um, college admissions scandal that erupted about a year ago A year and a few months ago, all across the country, many, many people of wealth and means, not all celebrities, but Lori Laughlin and her husband among those who have been identified as those 
who have been uh, falsifying applications uh, to universities with their children, uh, who have been, um, have been cheating on S- SAT exams, and uh, many of whom even pay bribes of, of hundreds and thousands of dollars in order to uh, gain admission for their, their, their children uh, to elite or the universities of their choice. What can today's college students learn from St. Augustine? What can families and parents and students of all ages learn from St. Augustine? This article describes a, um, a culture that has emerged in the last number of decades. And, and growing up over these last 60 years, it, it does seem like things have changed uh, quite dramatically. I, I um, honor and, and tip my cap to you parents out there who are raising children today. I, I remember my mother looking at the travails of my life as a young person in school and the bad grades I used to get, and then she said, well, he'll turn out. Uh, hopefully, hopefully he did, but the challenges for parents and families today seem so great when it comes to how will our children find their place in society, and we all desire for them uh, a measure of success, uh, a measure of achievement, if not some measure of wealth and status um, and, and privilege. We want them, want our young people to succeed. This article describes a culture that is so uh, fixated upon success that it loses the sight of the good. Pastor Kevin taught us many weeks ago about how St. Augustine helped us look at the good in life. And um, the article describes how our obsession with success often leads us away from the good which uh, Jesus taught and gave us. I shared this article, um, What Can Today's College Students Learn from St. Augustine, with Ann Fairbrother. Ann, for so many years, has been such a devoted and uh, deeply loved shepherd of our children in our children and family ministry. I I still fondly remember 14 years ago when she and Tim chose Atonement to be their church, and I was immediately grateful to God for bringing them. They, They immediately got involved in our worship life. And uh, Anne directly into our children and family ministry, helping as a teacher and an, and a, and an assistant to uh, Marsha Marquardt during those many years, and then eventually becoming the leader, the coordinator for our children and family ministry and our Little Steps ministry. She has loved so many of our children, and we thank God for Anne. I asked Anne for her input on uh, this article, and um, she's recorded her thoughts. So let's listen now to Ann Fairbrother. I have felt for a long time that we are pushing our kids too hard for high achievement and have completely overlooked their emotional and spiritual growth. They may be accomplishing outstanding academic success with multiple honors in AP classes and trophies for winning teams but they are also anxious and stressed. More and more young people are willing to cheat to get ahead, while others are totally obsessed with impressing their peers on social media. I noticed when it came time for selecting colleges, many parents hire tutors to prep their child for ACT and SAT tests. Students would take the test multiple times to increase their score so they could get into a good college. Some students would even pick a university just because it was far from home, as if that was impressive in itself. Wanting the best for our kids is natural. There is nothing wrong with encouraging them to be successful. It's when we make it a priority over developing good character, good emotional health, and over a good relationship with God that we lose focus on all that is important. In our house, we took a different approach to selecting a college. While many of their peers looked for a university of prestige, we looked for one that was a good fit for their personalities and preferences. We wanted a college that would provide not just academics, but also extracurricular activities and community service. 
We did not encourage them to live in an honors dorm. We wanted them to have time with friends without feeling pressured to constantly study. We encouraged them to make time for worship and prayer. We have not pushed them towards professions that will earn them big salaries, but towards ways to use their strengths and passions. We didn't parent them perfectly, but I am pleased that they have a conscience for social justice and they volunteer for nonprofit organizations. That is success in my eyes. Many of their high school classmates went to expensive and prestigious colleges. Many have very impressive jobs, but I wonder, are they happy? Are they fulfilled? Do they have too much college debt to give to charities? Are they too busy to care for others in need? I'm not sure. But as St. Augustine points out, we sometimes miss what is really important. The pursuit of God's truth and successfully becoming a good person gets lost in today's high-achieving competition to succeed by worldly standards. I personally am more interested in God's measurement of success. In our Bible story today, the mother of the sons of Zebedee approach Jesus and asks a question. Now, before we get into that question, oftentimes in the Bible, if we slow down and look, there's a story behind a story, this designation, identification of the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Who were these? Who are these people? Well, you might remember when Jesus called James and John at the Sea of Galilee, and that same day he called Simon Peter and said, follow me. The Bible says uh, James and John, the subs of sons of Zebedee, left their father in the boat with the hired men, dropped everything and followed Jesus. That is the reference to the sons of Zebedee. But, but notice that James and John left their father with the hired men. We know that uh, Jesus' followers were everyday people who came from all walks of life, many of them uh, hard scrabble, trying to make a living. We think of Simon Peter especially that way. But here we see that James and John left their father with the hired men. It seems that these particular fishermen uh, had some means, and in their life they had built a small business. They had a staff to go along with their effort to make a living as fishermen. James and John dropped all of that and left their father to follow Jesus. Where would he lead them? Well, now we see that their mother, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, approaches Jesus with a request, and Jesus asks her uh, a question that uh, is so important for today. He says, uh, what do you want? What do do you want? And she goes on to describe what she wishes for her sons. And perhaps uh, she had um, always desired that their life would become something important or special or that they would attain some measure of success, perhaps like their father, enough resources to have hired people working for them. We can't know. But um, in this question, we, we can imagine that she's thinking something like, well, whatever comes of their life on earth, I want them to have some status in eternity. She asked Jesus to grant that her two boys, James and John, would sit at his left and his right when they get to heaven. Whatever comes of this life on earth, I want to salvage something for them for eternity. Give them the best seats in heaven. Well, uh, Jesus sees this as a teaching opportunity, and he sits down with his disciples, as we can see in this image here, and, um, and he teaches them. Now, um, he, he, he says to them, you know how it is in the world, and, and we think about the world of business. We think about society and celebrity and leadership that is all around us. And Jesus says, you know how it is in the world among the Gentiles, among all the people. Uh, Their leaders lord it over them. They exercise authority in such a manner as to put people under them. But it shall not be so among you. If you would be great, 
you will be as one who serves. You will be as one like me who offers themselves for people. It's a startling uh, teaching, uh, but notice also in this slide that in their encounters, Jesus gave the sons of Zebedee another name. He had a nickname for them. In our sermon discussion this week, I encourage us to think back on our favorite nicknames. The sons of Zebedee became known by Jesus as the sons of thunder. Whatever would come of their life after they left the boat and their father, it was an adventure, and it would be an adventure of the highest calling. Their purpose in life would be to serve and save people. What can uh, today's college students learn from St. Augustine? Well, that article is well worth reading. I encourage you to look it up and and see for yourself, but it it launched me into a reading of the life of St. Augustine at great depth. I'd known that this person who lived 1,600 years ago was a person of great significance in the history of our faith, but I knew very little about his life. I read two biographies of Augustine, and and in some ways I think I, I get to read these things so that you don't have to, because I warn you if you are led into that path, there's a lot of detail and a lot of theology and history of great depth and Perhaps you find it as interesting as I do. But what we see, uh, we think of him as ancient and primitive 1,600 years ago. But already the church of the followers of Jesus was 400 years old. And there had been many, many things that had begun to evolve. And the identity of the church had emerged. And during the life of Augustine, the church itself went from being a persecuted minority under the Roman Empire to becoming the faith of the realm and the accepted faith even as the Roman Empire during his life collapsed under the attack of the barbarian Gauls. Rome itself collapses. But Augustine, who is an African, living in North Africa where the church had been flourishing and growing, is having his life unfold within these dynamics. The church that would emerge within the Roman Empire is the church that we often experience today, the church that aligns itself with power and wealth and privilege and influence in all manners. Sometimes we pray for good, but so often aligned with, with influence and with power that, that doesn't recognize or seem to represent anything like what Jesus demonstrated in his life. What can today's college students learn from the life of St. Augustine? He was uh, a very talented child with, with ability and, and um, opportunities his family was able to make because his father was a successful businessman. Uh, he, he didn't have much to do at all with the faith, but Augustine's mother, Monica, was devoted to Jesus and the church, and she prayed throughout her life, that her son would have this living relationship with God for eternity. And she despaired often during the early decades of his life. There's parents out there right now who I know are like my parents who prayed that their children would have faith and in a relationship with Jesus. And it's, it's a challenge. It was a challenge 1,600 years ago. For many decades, Augustine pursued by his own description a life of privilege and status of wealth, using his intellect, the opportunities his parents made available for him at every turn, the best education. He became an intellectual who achieved a measure of success and his life unfolded with uh, opportunities. And yet along the way, the emptiness in his soul was never filled. Augustine would go on to tell the story of how he surrendered his life to Jesus, how he called on God, how he opened the Bible one day and put his finger down. And God revealed to him in Scripture that his life was always going to be empty without Jesus, without his relationship with God. That's the uh, phrase that has uh, rung through the centuries for us, that the person who is 
is filled with anxiety, the person whose life is empty, they will never find rest until they rest in God. What can today's college students, what can parents and students of every age learn from St. Augustine? I knew that it was high time for me to, to learn more about his life because as a Lutheran, I was aware that um, 1,100 years after St. Augustine, a young man was studying for the priesthood out of what was described as the Augustinian tradition. It's a tradition not unlike the Jesuits, a tradition within our church Catholic. The Augustinian tradition particularly devoted to the study of Scripture. And when this young priest named Martin Luther was struggling with a church that had grown corrupt in its identification with the politics and the power of the day, a church that did not represent remotely the, the Jesus of the Bible and his teachings and his demonstrated life, he was urged by his uh, superiors to go to the source, go to the Word, go to the Bible, and find there the illumination of your path. And there he discovered a relationship with Jesus Christ. Luther himself uh, surrendered himself to Jesus. I am yours, save me. He prayed in despair the night before he stood before the Inquisition and before the Holy Roman Empire and the Pope and the Emperor, Pope's representative and the Emperor himself and said, here I stand, I can do no other. I want to illuminate Jesus and his serving of humanity for everyone, not for status and wealth and privilege and power. What can we learn from St. Augustine today? We can see this pathway from Augustine to Luther. We can see that a relationship with Jesus transformed the lives of the sons of Zebedee. We can see that they going forth into the world and the mission of the gospel as Jesus commissioned to go to the ends of the earth, earth reached all the way to North Africa and a humble person named Augustine who would become a bishop in the church and one whose story would be told so that you and I could stand here and receive God's grace, his fullness in the midst of our lives, which are under so much threat and strain. Uh, today, hearken back to that message. If your heart is not at rest, uh, surrender and offer yourself to God. I, I remember a prayer when I was a young college boy and mom and dad had dropped me off and I was as lonely as anybody could be and I laid on my dorm bed there and I, I don't know why, but I prayed a little prayer. I said, God, make my life what you want it to be. We pray that our lives represent God. We pray that we come to an insight like St. Augustine that reminds us that when our life is compelled by an ambition for worldly success and wealth and power, we are often obscuring, if not corrupting, the ministry and the witness of Jesus Christ. I think of... Uh, a sermon that was preached. Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder and two months to the day before he was shot and killed, Dr. Martin Luther King preached a sermon on this exact Bible passage, Matthew 20, 20 through 28. It was called the drum major instinct. I encourage our sermon discussion guide people to see the link that I put just a minute and 30 seconds of that sermon, but you'll get all you need to see that the life of a follower of Jesus, as uh, Jesus nicknamed James and John, is not a, a life of wilting. It's not a life of going quietly away in this world of tumult. It is to live an adventure. It is called to be those who bring it, <laughs> The, th the sons of thunder. But 
the thundering velvet hand of the gospel of Jesus Christ that reaches all the way through the corruption of this world with the good news of one who follows Jesus as a humble servant, as one who offers their life. What do you want? That's the question that Jesus asked the mother of the sons of Zebedee. It's the question God asks all of us who are raising children and, and still being raised ourselves. What do you want? Church, today we lift up prayers of healing for Greg Retzloff, who has a hernia and is working with his doctor to figure out the best medical steps forward. We also lift up prayers of comfort and protection and peace for, for our students and their families and educators in our community. As many schools have started this past week, and that just the anxiety and uncertainty runs high right now. So give peace and give protection to all that are affected and connected to the school systems in our area. And lastly, we pray prayers of peace and comfort and hope and justice for Jacob Blake and for Kenosha and for the police and all who are affected and touched by what we're seeing in the news coming out of Kenosha lately. Um, Tom and Judy Larson's son, Eric, is the deputy, deputy chief of police in Kenosha, so special prayers of comfort and peace and strength for the Larson family in this strange and unsettling time. If you have any additional prayer requests for us, I invite you to submit a prayer request on our homepage of our website. You go to About Us and then select prayer requests, and we, if you submit a prayer online, we will happily include that in our prayers today. And our prayers today, um, the response to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayer. And after our series of petitions, I will lift up a prayer for Kenosha that our bishop, Paul Erickson, has written, and pray that with me as well, please.
Let us pray for the people of God and for all people according to their need. God, we confess that our aspirations for success are often at odds with living as faithful disciples. Forgive us when we lie, manipulate, or cheat our way to advancement. Inspire us by your Holy Spirit as workers for good here on earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for administrators, teachers, and students everywhere in this season that marks opportunities to learn. Through education, advance your ways of blessing to us and through us. And also protect administrators, teachers, and students this fall and beyond amidst COVID and stress and anxieties in our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we look with you at all those in special need, both those we have lifted up and those in our thoughts and our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, our hearts are filled with sadness, anger, concern, and fear as we consider all that is happening in Kenosha. We lift before you all whose lives have been impacted, especially Jacob Blake and his family, those injured and killed in the protests, business owners whose livelihood have been destroyed, protesters crying out for justice and reform, police officers struggling to serve and protect, elected officials working to address long-standing injustice and discrimination, residents who are fearful and grief-stricken, and the congregations, pastors, and leaders who are trying to hold a space for lament, confession, renewal, and transformation. Grant us peace, Grant us courage, grant us hope that we may find our way through this current time and find ourselves more closely connected to you and to one another as we inch our way toward that beloved community that you desire for us all. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we worship God with our tithes and offerings. As always, you are invited to either mail cash or check to our church office. You can pay online through at-onechurch slash give. And finally, you can also submit a payment through text, which is easy and secure. The number for that is 414-626-9700. That is 414-626-9700. Let us worship God with our tithes and offerings. If anybody asks you who I am, who I am, who I am, if anybody asks you who I am, tell them I'm a child of God. Peace on earth and Mary rock the cradle, Mary rock the cradle, Mary rock the cradle. Child passing, singing softly, soft as the sound. 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, creator of all and source of life, at the birth of time your word brought light into the world. In the fullness of time you sent your word, born of Mary, to shine in our darkness and to make us your beloved children. And the first of Jesus' beloved children, his 12 disciples gathered with him in an upper room on a night in which they were scared and didn't feel safe to go out. And so they shared a meal together. And at that meal, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it for all to eat, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it for all to drink, saying, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his birth and life among us, his death and resurrection, We await Christ's coming again when all things will be restored in him. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here at Atonement, we believe this table is Christ's table, and all who desire the gifts of God are welcome to participate. Wherever you're joining us from today, you are welcome to participate with us in communion. If you have not set your table yet, pause this video now and resume it in a few minutes and share communion with us. All you need is some bread and some wine or some grape juice. We have directions on our online worship page about how to set a sacred space for you to share communion with those that gather with you today. Taste and see, friends, that the Lord is good. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. And now as you go out this week, to whatever this week may hold for you, 
receive the blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you with grace and mercy. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And now we go to the outdoor worship center where T-Bone will give us the last word. Go fish, show the Lord.